February 2007 near the Orlando, Florida airport. A woman in a trench coat and wig chased Colleen Shipman through a dark parking lot. In fact, the woman in the trench coat had been following Colleen for several hours through the baggage claim, through the airport, through the loading zone. She even sat behind Colleen on the shuttle bus that took them to the parking lot. And now that they were alone, the woman in the trench coat sprinted after Colleen and caught up with her. Colleen ran to her car and jumped in just as she slammed the door. She heard the mysterious woman yank on the handle, trying to get inside. Then, without warning, the woman outside began crying for help. She said she needed a ride, that her boyfriend was going to leave her in the lot overnight alone. She said she wanted to borrow Colleen's phone. Finally, when Colleen cracked the car window so the two could speak, The woman whipped out a can of pepper spray and sprayed it through the window. That's when Colleen floored it. We don't know how much pepper spray Colleen inhaled, but she was able to drive away from the scene and get to the police. Later, when the police found the woman in the trench coat and wig, they also found she had packed for a kidnapping. Her wig and BB gun had been dished in the garbage can but she had brought a steel mallet, a four-inch knife, trash bags, rubber hose, and diapers. As you may have guessed by now, the mysterious one we're talking about is Lisa Nowak, the NASA astronaut who stalked and attempted to kidnap a rival lover, Colleen Shipman. You might remember late-night talk show host making fun of Nowak for bringing her diapers on her 900-mile car trip, calling her astronaut, even though, according to her lawyer, she never used them. But keep in mind, Lisa Nowak is one of the best of us. She's an aeronautical engineer with no history of mental instability. She was a Navy captain, a test pilot, and a woman entrusted to operate a giant robotic claw in space on the back of a $450 million shuttle. If Lisa Nowak can't resist the temptation to engage in romantic obsession, what chance do the rest of us have? You're listening to The Re-Engineered You. This is a podcast about self-empowerment and all the myths, lies, and misconceptions we tell ourselves. Then we use science and history to bust those myths and re-engineer a better you. I'm your host, Todd Laments, the extrovert. And I'm the writer, researcher, and introvert, Joe Anthony, whose job it is to dig through the outer layer of no-duh on the internet and get us to the juicy facts. There's an old saying, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned which you might be surprised to learn, comes from a play from 1697 called The Morning Bride. This is the actual quote. Heaven has no rage, like love to hatred turned, nor hell of fury, like a woman scorned. That has a little more sting to it, doesn't it? Well, that's our topic today. Romantic obsession. When the pursuit of a mate goes too far, And if we want to know how far is too far, then we have a few myths we need to bust. Myth one, when it comes to pursuing someone else, we like to know where we stand. Are we dating yet? Are we an item? Are we a couple? Surely it's better to know, right? Myth two, why are some people irresistibly attracted to power or authority? or to people who are flat out unavailable. Myth three, if we want to score a mate, statistically, we should just stay in our league and communicate in positive, honest ways, right? These are the myths we're gonna tackle about romantic obsession. But first, Joe and I wanna know, who was Lisa Nowak shacking up with? 
who could possibly be worth driving across the country with a steel mallet in disguise for? Todd, I had a quick question to ask you. Now, I'm, I'm going to make a um, maybe a, a cruel assumption, but usually when somebody gets obsessed enough to, to go out of their way to like menace them with a, a, a meat tenderizer... Or, or pepper spray somebody through a window. When we're when we're willing to go all Jerry Springer on somebody, <laughs> usually we're aiming for someone who's out of our league. Would you say that's true? <laughs> someone who's super sexy. <laughs> yeah, some, somebody who's, who's worth it, right? Or at least we think they're worth it. So this woman was uh, just a, an engineer, an astronaut, a, a, a military uh, officer. Who in the heck could be out of her league enough to make her do this? Oh, oh I see what you're saying. Well, we're going to go over that today in our history section, but let me start with Lisa. Lisa was very married when she met William. Married for 19 years with three kids. So that's another thing that popped in my head is how do you have time to do all this when you are in <laughs> high school, three kids married? And- I would love to. It's probably not true. But in my mind, she's dropping off the kids for, like, soccer. And, and, and she, they're like, Mom, why do you have the wig, the mallet, and the, the, the BB gun? <laughs> now, Lisa wasn't really clear about the relationship. And this found out um, later when she was arrested and she was interviewed by the detectives. And when they asked what her relationship was with William, and she was kind of muddy on it. She said that they were co-workers and, they were in, uh, and that they had hooked up. But she thought in her head she had built it up that they were exclusive and they were heading towards something very, very serious. Okay. A clue and a sign is something we always want to know. You know, where we, we talked about that in the intro about where we stand. And she did have an apart, a key to his apartment. Now, when I was single, I wouldn't give a woman a key to my apartment. I had before. But it's because I really like her that I want her to be come and go as I please and wouldn't be worried to walk in on me with anybody else. I'm just with her. Right. Here's the key. And here's where I've planted the trip wires. <laughs> so looks like our hero here, Mr. Handsome, um, wasn't as interested in her as in the series. It was more of just a hookup for him. Okay. So she was very uncertain about the relationship, but really got her excited and emotional so you would it surprise you to know that that it might be better to leave things uncertain in a relationship i thought i've always wanted to know where i stand either we're together and we're serious or we're not that's why facebook has a relationship status because it makes people <laughs> feel satisfied knowing that right you're gonna tell me that i've been wrong all these years <laughs> this this uh podcast the the formula is we we find our assumptions and then and then we bust them, and I pretend like I somehow knew that the whole time, and I make you feel bad, which <laughs> unfair. I think it's when they say that I love you or I want to be in a relationship with you. That means they're not going to leave you, right? It's like yeah. a control, even. Right. Yeah. Labeling it somehow gives you some control uh, over the situation. Um, so. We're going to start talking about how much control that actually gives you and what is more attractive to people. Um, this comes from, uh, first, the reciprocity principle. Um, I mean, you can, it's so well known as a, a um, psychology phenomenon, you can look it up on Wiki. Like, it, it's just sort of a given. Um, and here's the, the quick definition uh, from Wiki. I know colleges don't like using Wiki as a source, but they, they are vetted. Uh, it's the act of a person feeling an attraction to someone only upon learning that someone has been aware of their attraction. Um, so to break that down, uh, Todd, are you more attracted when you find out somebody is attracted to you already? Uh, oh, absolutely. It means they're in my, my wheelhouse. They're in my right. aquarium. It, it, it means that they've sort of like, they've already selected you out. They've already picked you. You're good enough for them. So the rest is your decision. Low hanging fruit. <laughs> <laughs> or just, or just fruit on the same vine or, or level that you are. Um, so, so this has been sort of the classic uh, idea of attraction. That's been our model for a very long time 
is um, uh, you are attracted to somebody, you declare your intent, you say, hey, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a seven on you. Like, I, I am very attracted to you. And the other person, the, the uh, idea of uh, reciprocity, the reciprocity principle is once you know that I'm uh, a seven in my attraction to you, you then go up to a seven potentially. And this, this has been upheld through studies throughout the years. This, this goes back quite a ways. Um, now, a new study has come out. Uh, this came out a couple of years ago. And this came from, uh, I'm going to quote the article so other people can look it up. It's called, He Loves Me, He Loves Me Not. Uh, Uncertainty Can Increase Romantic Attraction. Uh, and this comes from uh, researchers Whitechurch, ER, Wilson TD, and Gilbert TD. Um, so they, they had a college study, and they had women viewing Facebook profiles. Uh, and they had um, male students uh, who, they would look at their profile, and they would be told uh, that the men either like them a lot, like them uh, an average amount, or they like them an average amount, potentially higher, but they're not sure. So they, they at least like them an average amount. Um, so I'll, I'll for, frame this as a question. Um, who do you think uh, was the most attractive to these women? The one that are on the borderline. The ones that there might be, they might not be. That, that's dead right. It, it's yeah. their attraction relatively matched. Like, like up until the uncertainty uh, it, it, they fell in line with the reciprocity principle. Um, when they were told this guy was average on them, they were average on the guy. They're like, okay, well, then I am uh, average attracted to Mr. Average. If they are told this guy really likes you, they would return that attraction. They'd say, well, then I really like him. When they found the guy, and when they got to the research subject where he was average or higher, but we don't know how much, their attraction level didn't just meet that average or higher. It exceeded the guys that like them a lot. So, so it went off the chart, basically. So uncertainty is a big deal. And it feels more satisfying to label where you are. Like, it feels more satisfying to hear somebody say, you know, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, I'm attracted to you. At a scale of 1 to 10, I'm a 10. It feels more satisfying to know it but it actually causes you to be more attracted to someone to not know it, to know that they like you, but you don't know how much. Joe, do you ever feel that way when someone likes you that as soon as you find they like you, you think, well, well, there must be some, because of our own low self-esteem, we think <laughs> there must be something wrong with them. So let me stop back and measure. What's the, that old Woody Allen joke? Uh, I wouldn't want to be a part of an organization that would have me as a member. <laughs> it's kind of the same <laughs> exactly. thing. Like if somebody's attracted yeah, to me, there's like, something wrong with what's them. What's wrong with them? Yeah. They, but if you have to win them over, you think, okay. Yeah. They, they don't know they my, they haven't noticed it. my faults yet. So I'll keep yeah. those hidden a bit longer. <laughs> now, just to keep people from going out and being jerks when they're trying to uh, date others, they have to show a uh, at least an average amount of attraction to begin with. So it's not just they're not ignoring people. They're not negging them. They are they are just showing show some interest. Some interest. Yes, exactly. Um, and and this really kind of plays into Lisa Nowak's story. As you mentioned, she didn't know where she stood with this guy. She she knew that they had hooked up. She knew that he had some attraction for her, but she did not know where her relationship stood. Um, so, so far, if we're talking about romantic obsession, score one for the romantic obsessive people out there because the unknown variable makes them attracted. So usually when I think of uh, romantic obsessives, um, I, I, I joked earlier about the Jerry Springer show. This Lisa Nowak, that is not Lisa. You that can't, crazy strippers is what you're thinking, right? Yeah, I'm thinking of like, uh, 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 women fist fighting on a stage over a dude who's 300 pounds. So uh, Lisa Nowak, um, not just anyone can become an astronaut, right? Not just any, well said, not just anyone can become an astronaut. For one NASA astronaut class, 18,000 people will um, apply. Now the class size is 48 people. So this is not like me getting a job down at Burger King here. The 18,000 people that applied are all engineers, pilots, they have military background. 
they're all by our standards would be extremely qualified. So, uh, obviously, they all don't get in. Otherwise, we'd be riding the bus with astronauts. Right. So, only 48 out of 18,000. So, she was one of those. She was one of the few in the proud. Um, she studied aerospace engineering at the United States Naval Academy. She got a master's degree in aeronautical engineering. Now, she married a classmate, Richard, so she, who was already super successful from the Naval Academy. So she was established in her home life and in her, in her career. I mean, we, we see wow. astronauts as heroes, don't we? Yeah, totally. Who as a kid hasn't thought for a while that I want to grow up and go to the moon or go into space? I think everyone's made a cardboard helmet that said NASA misspelled somehow. Yeah, and half of the Hollywood movies are made about it, right? Right. Now, she also had two twins. She had, well, she had a son and twin girls. Okay. Twins. Which makes me think, how do you have time to be out? <laughs> Again, I'm just reading about how busy these high achievers are makes me exhausted. <laughs> it makes me feel lazy. This is the guy she was after, though. You talked about earlier about who could she possibly look up to. She's a beautiful woman, too, by the way. Yeah. Fit, beautiful, smart, successful. 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. Right. William was a catch himself. He was Mr. Irresistible. Um, very handsome. He was a, and he was a fellow student of Novak. Now, I am sure in the NASA program, it would be frowned upon to have married um, married moms hooking up with other students. What do you think, Joe? I'm assuming they may have something against that, like a policy. <laughs> and both of them would have, let's just say, a, a lot to lose. Right. I, I don't think you're allowed to have like um, like like we're talking like work fraternization. Imagine you're like having an argument with somebody and you're trying to like maneuver something on that giant like the the, the shuttle. You're trying to like yeah. bolt something into place that's worth four hundred fifty million dollars <laughs> while and you're screaming at somebody. And you know that awkward thing where you hook up with someone then you're at work with them and you pretend you <laughs> ignore each other. <laughs> Everybody on the show be like, hey, guys, what's going on? <laughs> Why they're are you not, guys being so weird? <laughs> they're not looking at each other and they're in the same capsule. <laughs> yeah. They're not floating next to each other. <laughs> they turned away. Okay, but Mr. Handsome here, William, he grew up in Anchorage, Alaska. He was a lifelong pilot. He flew in the U.S. Navy, combat missions in the Persian Gulf. So he was a war hero. He was experienced. Um, and he got the honor, the great honor, to be a space shuttle pilot. Wow. And I have a few friends who are commercial pilots. And to me, they're heroes. Yeah. So I'm going to have to ask next time I talk to to them about what it's like, if what an honor that would be to actually be a pilot of a space shuttle. That must be the the head of the food chain, right? Right. There's, there's all these jokes about um, uh, pilots and, and how they, like, they 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 hit on a lot of women and they get a lot of sex. Is that completely? Is that is that like correlated to how high and how fast you go on your airplane? Because if if a shuttle pilot is the top of that, yeah. I can see why he'd be attracting you know other people from NASA maybe. So to answer your question, she wasn't looking up to anybody. She was looking side to side. She finally met her intellectual, successful you know maybe her soulmate. Okay. Well, I think that I think that mostly answers why um, William. Um, but but part of that, I I love how you put that that she was looking side to side because she had literally gone to space. So the only other place she could look is below her. <laughs> I I mean that both in a, a accomplishment, attractiveness, and and peers. Um, so we're going to to ask the question, or at least I'm going to ask. Um, are you attracted to power? Like, like does does someone's power make you attracted to them more or less? I think definitely when you find out someone is has more money, you look up to them as someone who has more resources, more interesting. Yeah. And sometimes that's just in, like, we've seen it in public speaking where we hear someone speak, we'd have no interest in them, and all of a sudden they look a lot more attractive once you get to know them. Right. I, I find for me personally, uh, um, power and money... N not nearly as much as like if somebody tells me that they're they're doing something and it requires a, a ton of uh, um, education or intelligence or time or just if it's really interesting if you know you won't hook me faster than saying that like 
oh, I, I'm a, a specialized doctor or something, or, or something that I can ask a lot of dumb questions about. Uh, I think it's attractive because it shows their discipline and their perseverance. They go, wow, this is someone who has worked really hard for something. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a good way to put it. Um, so we're, we're, we're going to ask the, the seemingly obvious question, uh, why are we attracted to power? Uh, and we're also going to ask, why are we attracted to wealth? Why are we attracted to authority? We just want to get this out of the way. We, we say at the top of every show that we're trying to get through the no-duh layer of the internet. This very much lands in no-duh, but we, we do need to cover it uh, because it's, it's human nature, really. So, um, first, I, the obvious one, why are we attracted to wealth? You, you said it. We, we don't actually need to go too deep into that. Um, wealth equals resources. Um, I remember reading an article. Okay, okay so just for anyone who um, hasn't seen uh, Todd on Instagram, uh, uh, Todd, um, how, how often do you work out? Five times a week. Five times a week. Um, now, uh, it, it's clearly for health, but um, it impresses people, right? That That's something that, like... Uh, we were we were joking earlier today that like when you see another guy at the gym is as big as you that's a rival <laughs> yeah pe- yeah exactly people touch me who don't know me strangers <laughs> kids <laughs> women men will come up and touch my muscles and say well look at this <laughs> i'm not bragging it's just something that happens <laughs> yeah i i'm bringing it up uh i'm not i'm not trying to like muscle shame you i don't think that's a real thing i think i just made that up <laughs> oh no we love it yeah, um, i love it please right <laughs> bring it on <laughs> uh, uh do you wash dishes because you look like you pass a lot of plates buddy <laughs> um but i'm i'm joking about this because uh i i read that uh weightlifting um is a resource brag that that when you're dating and when you're when you're um when you're trying to impress people with with power and wealth, it's basically you bragging that you have the resources to do it because it takes a lot of money to eat well. It takes a lot of time invested to keep up your your physical you know your prowess, uh, and it also signals that you have good genes. Uh, okay. So it's it's a it's a combination uh, of of brags. Um, so. Uh, w- w- wealth, uh, uh, resources; those are um, uh, those are types of power that people are attracted to, and it's simply because it means higher survival, uh, sur- survivability. It's if you have either of those things, you basically win the survival game of life. A better protector and provider, right? Right, exactly. Eat my leftover food, and I can beat up anybody <laughs> that tries to get you. Right. Yeah. It's, it's not only could you uh, stop a uh, attacking tiger, um, I could survive on the leftovers from your protein shakes. <laughs> so, uh, authority. Why are we attracted to authority? Um, and, and this one, I'm going to pull straight from Psychology Today. Uh, which is um, it's paternal familiarity that authority usually for us uh, is an indicator that um, somebody is is a a parent to us even in modern times like if you're an adult I'm a grown man I will still like like when the cops tell me to do something I act like they're my dad so it's or if there's an older male you just kind of you listen to them a little harder and open the door for them, and right. You push the res- hold the respect button down a bit further without even thinking about it. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so that can convey uh, or 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 um, be combined with attraction. That when somebody has authority over you, you're more likely to um, uh, be attracted to them. You want to please them also. Right. Um, a, a little caveat to that is if you had a uh, unavailable caregiver um, when you were a child, uh, you are more likely to be attracted to someone who is unavailable habitually. So if mom or dad uh, had a job that kept them out late and they didn't come home very often and they missed your school plays, you will oftentimes find yourself dating somebody who is unavailable, who comes out late, who, who doesn't come to whatever your functions are. Which you'd think would be the opposite, that you'd find someone to fill that void that you didn't have your whole life. Right. Yeah. But as we found out in our our dysfunctional relationship episode, that was our first episode we ever did, we have something called the familiarity principle of attraction, where we are attracted to people more if they repeat things our our folks did, our parents did. 
and it's granular down to the the language they use, the face expressions. So check, do check out our first episode. Yeah, my my favorite was when we talked about the the subtle like criticisms and stuff that that we seek out. So our last one uh, that we're going to touch on is um, just desirability and power in general. Uh, what is so attractive about powerful men, powerful women, or, or people in positions of authority? Uh, I'm going to quote a Metro UK article, and this is psychologist Natalie Crawley. Uh, there are so many articles about this, I couldn't possibly pick one that was the authority, quote unquote. But I really just like the way she, the, the language she uses to describe it. So here's the quote I'm going with uh, from Natalie Crowley. The desire for those in power is deeply rooted in our psyche. In evolutionary terms, someone in a position of power is seen as someone with resources and abilities that will create viable offspring, and therefore we are driven to form an attachment to them. So basically we have an attraction to power, and a lot of it is basically about nurturing and authority. It, it, it's, it's the hack that combines all the other attractions we already mentioned. And we want to have beautiful kids. And we want to have beautiful kids, yes. Um, so when she, uh, w- w- um, when Noak is looking around, and she's, we're always trained to look for the the best mate possible. Her her husband is already a, a pilot and a, you know a, a, almost as successful as she is. So the only step up she can pick apparently is a guy that is right now in, is it, as the story takes place. From what I've gathered, he's flying a shuttle. So, <laughs> like I think she was in this. He was in the sky when she did this uh, shenanigans, glowing like with gold good glow, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> so if you want to talk the peak, like like sh- this to me represents the pinnacle of romantic obsession as a woman who literally can't find someone who is physically higher than, than the guy she picked out. And we're not making fun of you, William. We're really seriously je- jealous of your smarts and your good looks. Are you kidding? I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm about to drive across the country with a BB gun and diapers for this guy. Uh, you could probably get a, a woman without three kids and a husband, though, bro. <laughs> yeah. He, he does clearly have choices. So. so William may have had choices, but Lisa seems like she was going to take matters into her own hand. So how did she start that? Like, how was how was this? How, how did our cart get off the rails? This relationship went on for many years. William lo- left his wife in 2005 after being married for 19 years, and then Noak separated from her husband in 2007. She left with the intentions and the the future envisioned of having a life with William. William tells her that he's in a committed, serious relationship with another officer, Colleen Shipman. I mean, aren't these some promiscuous pilots? Uh, I, is that a, um, what do you call it, a, a, a double, is that a redundant phrase, <laughs> promiscuous pilots? I think pilots are just promiscuous, right? I wrote that part of this episode. I think it's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Joe might have wrote the other 2,000 words, but I wrote those two. Those are the ones that count. <laughs> Okay, so the breaking point was, first of all, William tells her. He just breaks it down for her. I need your key back. We can't be saying, I'm with this woman, and it's serious. Now, in my opinion, this must have knocked Lisa for a loop. Mm -hmm. I just left my husband and my three kids for you. Right, she threw a match behind her and burned her life down, and now this guy is saying, "I oh, found somebody yeah. else." Yeah, and I'd be—I mean, I, I, can, I can feel that. I, and I've been in—and I do want to say on the record, though, that I've been in relationships where I thought that it was more serious than it was. That I thought that I was with a woman and we were headed towards marriage, and I couldn't have been more wrong. So I can kind of relate to this. Okay. Um, so. Bill Williams said to the police, he said that when he told her, she didn't freak out or anything, but I think she was probably a little stunned. She went to his apartment, got on his computer, and then she read through all these love emails between William and Sh- and Shipman, Colleen. Uh-oh. So I'm sure she read one after being a very intelligent woman. She reads fast. She's reading these love letters, probably got a calendar out, too, thinking, oh, he's sleeping with me this day. And writing her, and I don't know that, but oh 
God, this is why you don't cheat on an engineer, because they start a <laughs> schematic of your life. Right. So he reads through all these love emails, and then he also finds the emails for Colleen Shipman's travel plans. <laughs> okay. So everything lined up right. She's got – she's – confused she's mad she's jealous she sees these love letters then she sees where colleen's going that's when she hit the crazy button can can i say that right up until the pepper spray i'm kind of on lisa's side like like what you said like she she thought it was more serious he never defined the relationship i i kind of think aside from you know the the mallet i would agree with that if she was going to kidnap william yeah, that's true. <laughs> but not this other lady doesn't know anything. That that is true. Yeah, I would I would be there. There'd be that uh, scene from Reservoir Dogs where they're playing stuck in the middle, and it's it's a, a NASA astronaut strapped to the chair. So, if we're looking at uh, uh, insane pursuits, that ultimately our episode really is about um, when is romantic obsession too far. Uh, how do we actually, uh, how how frequently do people aim out of their league? Uh, how often do we actually aim for people that are unavailable, more attractive than us? I- is it crazy or is it human nature? So I'm going to start there. Um, Todd, how how often, I mean, do you think that, that it's normal or at least frequent for people to, to aim out of their league, to, to get obsessed with people who are more attractive or more um, desirable than them? I think so. I, I think was... That, what's that? Yeah, definitely the attraction thing is the big one. They just can't help it. It's just puppy love. I, I, I think that's that's a good way to put it, puppy love, is we, 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 we start crushes, and then we in turn have to get crushed to, to lower our, our not, not standards, but our, our gaze, so to speak. And I've done that. I've liked someone so much that, Joe, I, I just can't believe that they, they, they don't like me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, are you sure? <laughs> What? Yeah, what, how can you not? Uh, it, it, that's when you say, don't you know people touch me in the store? Just like, like the... <laughs> well, no, and you start are... thinking, it, talking about fantasizing, and you think about um, being with them and how much fun you'd have and you yeah. know, the, the Hollywood stuff. I, I, I have, I'm I in my head all the time, so if somebody sits by me on the bus too long, I'm, I'm thinking about what our house in Key West is going to look like. <laughs> So we're going to talk about um, a study that came from the University of Michigan uh, by Elizabeth Bruch and um, E.J. Newman. And this is called Aspirational Pursuit of Mates in Online Dating Markets. I will point out, uh, whenever we have a study and they have like a a flaw or a blind spot or a lack of a control, I, I will point it out. This one is just heterosexual dating. So we're only looking at the data derived from uh, heterosexual dating websites and the studies of about four cities that they did. Um, So with these four cities, uh, they studied New York, Boston, Chicago, and Seattle, and they are looking at desirability. Now, when I say desirability, uh, I don't mean like how physically attractive someone is. We're only gauging how many messages they get early when they make their profile. Um, so, uh, if you ask, say, uh, um, uh, you know, anyone of, uh, say, say you ask heterosexual women what's attractive, you'll get answers all across the board. Um, you may also get specific answers toward types, like body types. Everyone might want broad shoulders, slim waist. Everyone might basically point to a firefighter and say, that guy. <laughs> right. Some people say honesty and intelligence. Another person will say tall, dark, good looking. Right. So we are only focused on how many messages somebody gets. That's our that's our meter for uh, desirability. So desirability, not attraction. Not what they say, but what they actually do. Yes, that's a good way of putting it. Um, most people, when they start on a dating site, they get a handful of messages at most, um, but a small fraction uh, receive far more. Uh, we talked on an earlier episode about how... Um, uh, 80% of women on dating websites are competing for the top 20% of men. That came from the book Dataclism, uh, which is all about, you know, again, metrics on, on online dating. Um, so for this study, for the desirability study, 
Um, for example, uh, a 30 year old woman, this is the woman who received the most messages in this study. 30 year old woman living in New York received f- uh, 1,504 messages during uh, the period of observation, uh, equivalent to one message every 30 minutes, day and night for the entire month. So when we say some people on the higher end of the scale get more messages, they get a lot more messages. More than their share. This is not fair. Right. This this is unfair. This study should really just demonstrate to you that um, everyone shoots out of their league. Everyone starts aiming at the top. Everyone builds romantic obsession. And then they adjust. Um, How much they adjust also depends on their, their age. So uh, this is the funnest game I love doing when we find good research. Um, Todd, what do you think is the, according to the, the, the study I'm about to reveal, so not your opinion, but what you think the public thinks, what is the optimum desirability age for a woman? 25. That's a good guess. Um, I, 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 w- I probably would have guessed about the same before reading this, in that ballpark at least. Um, according to this study, it, 18, and then it goes downhill from there. It is it is a linear progression. <laughs> it's, yeah, that, the look you gave me is, are you nuts? But yeah, that, that's too young. Yeah, no, it's um, <laughs> uh, uh, desirability by age. Uh, uh, men are very predictable and uh, sometimes very stupid. Um, we keep this. Men don't mature. We just get older. Yes, that's we a very good We just keep disappointing you, women. I apologize for all of us. <laughs> uh, that, yeah, no, that we keep disappointing women. That, no, that's that's true. It, it's it's men are predictable. Uh, it's it's eighteen, and it just slants down until she's sixty. Um, for again, this isn't our opinions. These are um, based on how many messages they got uh, while doing online dating in a thirty day period. Uh, for men, uh, what is the peak desirability uh, age according to uh, this? According to how many messages a guy would get? Thirty. I was going to originally guess uh, thirty or late twenties because that's like yeah. physically you 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 start declining in health after a certain period. Like once you once you are no longer you know growing and hormones start declining. You're not a boy anymore. You're a man, but you're not old and decaying. Right. I, I my brain went to firefighter. Like I, I, I always, I'm just like, yeah, it's got to be like peak physical fitness, right? He's, he's very. He thinks his firefighters really got going on. <laughs> I, I, I'm still mentally a child, so there's only astronaut and firefighter to me. That's the only people that exist. Were you saved from a fire when you were a boy, and the guy carried you out, <laughs> gave you Weirdly, the stuffed animal? <laughs> I, I wish I was saved by an astronaut on a ladder, if you can believe that. Um, so no, the the peak desirability for men, we were both off. It's uh, fifty. Really? Yeah. 50. Uh, that blew my mind when I read that. And I was going to ask you, why Why do you think it's that old? Like, why do you think it's 50? And again, many, that's desirability. That's how many messages they get for dates. That's not physical attractiveness rating. That's how much people actually message them. A combination of resources, comfort, father figure. Uh, my mind's spinning, but... You, you, know. you Well, your mind just spun to all the right answers, I think, because those are all the three categories that we covered in attractiveness in uh, Section 2. So I, 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 I totally believe you're right about that. Um, we don't have an answer from this study, but I totally think that based on our attractive metrics and what makes somebody attractive, the power, the authority, the, the um, resources, basically that's, that's men hit that when they hit 40 to 50, apparently. Um, and I've seen this in my life where um, the people say they don't care anything about money, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> then you will see their choices. And, and while they're doing it, they'll even say, I don't care about that. It's like, well, I, people who say I don't care about money, they will five minutes later be in an argument with their spouse about money. So, <laughs> right. so uh, another thing they uncovered in the article, and I'm just going to quote this directly because I thought it was amazing. Uh, they said, quote, we find that both men and women pursue partners who are on average about 25% more desirable than themselves by our measure and that they use different messaging strategies with partners of different desirability. 
So uh, when we're talking, like we start the episode and we're talking like any of us could be Lisa Nowak. Lisa Nowak is the best of us as far as human beings go. She's a, she's an astronaut. She's an officer. She should have known better. Nobody should know better. This is human nature, apparently. 25% is how much people shoot out of their league. Um, so messaging partners uh, who are more desirable than you, that's normal. Um and then it's also uh, something that I, I was reading. Some the, the, Somebody in the comment section, they were like, you know, it's foolish or it's wishful thinking. But this tells me it's not wishful thinking. It is, in fact, just human nature, that we aim high and then we adjust afterward. So um, this isn't true, uh, but just for the sake of argument, um, if I told you, Todd, that I only date tens, what... And and I said that you know you, you you if you knew me to do that that the only time I will ever you know go on a date is if it's somebody wildly out of my league. What strategy would you advise for that? <laughs> uh, the advice I would have is um, that you only ask out tens, okay, right, and that you build a pretty big portfolio of value. Oh right, make yeah. make make myself as valuable as possible. Talk about the things that you're great at, which is public speaking and writing. Right, and then you get those groupies, and they'll be, I was gonna say nine and a halfs or tens. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned you mentioned uh, uh, only asking out tens exclusively. Um, this came up in in this research, this study, and it was uh, when people want to um, uh, message and date somebody who is out of their league, who is more than twenty five percent or twenty five percent or more uh, more desirable than themselves. Um, it, it, it's counter to what you and I would think. I would think you would want to play the numbers, that you would want to ask out a lot of people. So you have more chances of a higher number, like a 10, turning around and actually not splashing a drink in my face. Uh, that if I, if I ask, you know, if I have like that 20% chance, I would have to ask 10 people out, you know, five people out on a date for one yes. Just math. It's nothing. Yeah, it's a numbers game. Um, it turns out, according to the study, according to watching people communicate online for dates, uh, it, it's, that's, it works the opposite way. Uh, according to the study, um, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote the, the article again. Uh, they say, quote, One might imagine that individuals who make a habit of contacting potential partners significantly more desirable than themselves would also initiate more contacts overall to increase their chances of getting a reply. But they do the opposite. The number of initial contacts an indi individual makes falls off rapidly with the increasing gap. And it is the people approaching the least desirable partners who send the largest number of messages. So interesting. The people who are low fives and sixes and they're going after tens, they send less messages and they target specific tens. They obsess. They and measure. They, they measure. They yeah, they 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 fixate and they try to design their messages for that one person. Separation and the preparation. That they're snipers. Yes, and it doesn't work. <laughs> it, it makes it feel like you're being deliberate and it should work. What it does is it actually limits your chances. It means that you're not going to fall into that 20%. They're on to us. They yeah. know what we're up to. They've seen this before. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's human nature. We can spot it when somebody is of a lower desirability than us. Uh, and and if if you decide to go with somebody of a lower desirability, there's something about them that attracts you. It's not a you. It's really hard to trick humans uh, when it comes to their own sort of desirability. Um, now, when you try to impress somebody who is out of your league, uh, do you act nicer or do you act uh, meaner? Super sweet. I, I know this is how I know when I'm attracted to somebody, and I've shared this with you before. I'm not proud of this. I'm just going to tell you this is what I do. <laughs> I will like kind of pre-rehearse what I'm going to say to them. <laughs> right. Like I play it through my head and get these little scenarios, little skits, and I'll then it's showtime when I see them. Right. And I, and I hate myself for doing it. I always feel dirty for doing <laughs> it, but I can't help it, you know. 
I, you'll know I'm trying to impress you when I have like a, a, a factoid or a neat thing to tell you and it's specific to you. That's mm-hmm. It's not just me rambling about things I've been reading. We're not that, it wasn't just off the top of our head. We've been thinking about this shit for a while. Yeah. Oh, oh my God. Uh, every, um, back in like my 20s, every guy would just have like a war room. Like, 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 like dating with <laughs> them was like plotting and planning. If I run into Ashley, I'm ready. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, so the the data from the study uh, kind of um, backs that up. Uh, women show an increase of positive words when they communicate with more desirable partners. So they turn on the sweetness, um, while men show a decrease when they're trying to attract more desirable partners. So they're trying to play it cool. Okay, I, I believe that. Yeah. Uh, the effect size, uh, this is quoting the article, the effect size is modest but consistent across all four cities. In all four cities, men experience slightly lower reply rates when they write more positively worded messages. So they like when they play the jerk and are not, not interested. So any, yes, that's what oh, we're saying. Man. It's bad news, Todd. Well, what um, about the men? Do they like it when the women are sweet? Uh, it didn't show um, a, a big enough number from what I could read uh, uh, to indicate whether or not that was a turnoff. However, generally across the board, when somebody turns on the sweetness, it's an indicator. Uh, if, they're, if they're overly sweet, as, um, when women do it, it, it's indicating or signaling that they are a lower di- desirability than you. It, does, it seems counterintuitive. So totally. if they like you and, you and you tell them you like them back, they run away. But if you pretend you don't like them, then they chase you. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to uh harken back to the first study we talked about in this episode which is you have to show there's some attraction but you don't tell them how much that that um the yeah the the reciprocity versus the unknown and the unknown seems to be winning in pretty much across the board This is hard man Show <laughs> the, the, the simple takeaway I believe that that I can see from these two studies is show that you're attracted but you don't necessarily have to tell them exactly what your number and positioning is. I'm just envisioning this couple dancing, like, and they're two stepping forward and <laughs> backwards. It's just, it really is playing games. People who say they don't like to play games play the games they're the full best. Yeah. Oh my God! No, no, that's that's really the takeaway from these studies is uh, if you want to be attractive to other people, play games. Just just interest them basically. So. After uh, Lisa uh, obviously showed interest for William a bit too much, uh, she tried to kidnap a woman. Um, How did that play out? Like, uh, I mean, I haven't heard about her after she got roasted on you know national TV. Well, I'm well read on this now. (laughs) This is what happened. Uh, She was. This is very serious. She was charged with two felonies: attempted kidnapping and burglary. She was also initially charged with attempted murder. Oh, wow. Uh, oh. Yeah, so. The, I guess there's a knife and a meat tenderizer there, but she didn't, you know. She, she didn't, didn't do it yet, but it was borderline. Um, so she, she got a, what I refer to as a really good lawyer. Yeah. So she had a really lot of money. So what you're going to hear about, you kind of made me mad because if you and I did even thought these things, We'd still be in jail, Joe. Yeah. So for all this, she got the attempted murder dropped. Um, got a bunch of lawyers involved. She got one year probation and fifty hours of community service. Wow. Which outraged Colleen Shipman. I mean, can you imagine? Somebody tracked you down, stalked you, and and came at you with pepper spray, and then they get fifty hours of community service. I can see that being a little bit upsetting. Now, the biggest thing, and I know you don't like no dust stuff, but I'm going to give you one right here. Her attorney said that she had temporary insanity plea and that she suffered from obsessive compulsive disorder, insomnia, and depression. Well, yeah, you think, right? Right. <laughs> I mean, is that a little obsessive compulsive? Is it insomnia if you're up all night planning somebody else's kidnapping? But I think you and I know, Joe, we know a lot of high achievers and high earners. They are all obsessive compulsive. Yes. You don't get a lot of anything without being a little bit crazy. 
I'm going to tease this one. We are eventually coming out with an episode about how obsession drives success. So, yeah, I'm on board with that. And how different people can channel it in positive or negative ways. And it, it is a fine line. So, yeah. Yes, you are a <laughs> obsessive compulsive, Lisa Nowak. Right. But all that stress, you know, there, there was other theories on it, too, that, uh, you know, everyone likes to blame everything on their job, too. Oh, it was a stressful job, but. You can say that about police officers, firefighters, doctors. I mean, <laughs> life is stressful, so doesn't mean you have to go kidnap somebody. The meat cleaver is kind of disturbing, though, right? Oh, is it was a mallet and a knife. Yeah, yeah either way, it, it's it's yeah. very disturbing. Um, I, I hope it was all for scare tactics. I suppose if one person has the, the um, my job was stressful uh, excuse, it might be someone who shot themselves up into the atmosphere on an explosive device. Um, but you're right. There's usually not a great excuse for, you know, uh, uh, stalking somebody. The one the good laugh I had about this, though, she really had some great attorneys. The attorneys somehow got her case sealed. I guess they were worried about Joe. Maybe she would be embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> How do you get more embarrassed than this? Right. What could possibly be? She has some good stuff in there that we're missing out on some of these emails, baby. <laughs> Oh, uh, they're already they already called her an astronaut on live TV. How much worse could it get? <laughs> if you're on late night TV or not a guest, or you say you did something really stupid. It's easy for us to get caught up in the pursuit of someone else. Whether it's harmless, like daydreaming about a crush. Imagine your lives might be like together. Or something more sinister, like imagining kidnapping and torturing a romantic rival. Either way, we're built to pursue and be pursued. And because we're built for it, we can't help but fantasizing about it. Just remember, not knowing where you stand romantically can be more exciting than having a relationship defined. And this can get even more exciting and more dangerous when you're pursuing someone who has power or success. You can find yourself confused, desperate, and entirely under their control. And if you have a habit of pursuing people who are out of your league, just remember, it's not wishful thinking, it's human. Statistically, we're more apt to aim for someone 25% more desirable than us. And it's up to us to calibrate appropriately if the person we're pursuing doesn't respond. Where love is concerned, feel free to take risks. Forgive yourself for daydreaming or aiming too high. Temper your romantic obsessions if you start fantasizing about kidnapping a coworker. And if you're on the online dating market, stay positive. Unless you're a man texting a woman. Then stay slightly less positive. You've been listening to the Reengineered You. Thank you so much for listening to the show. You mean the world to us. We have a new episode every week. You can connect with us at www.re-engineeredu.com, where we have research links, show notes, blog articles for each of our episodes. We also appreciate feedback. We love spirited debates. But um, if you're too positive, we may reject you. <laughs> and you can obsess and chase after us anytime we want. That's we, right. We would love that. <laughs> <laughs> We're not experts in anything, but we've got an opinion on everything. Speaking of opinions, uh, do you want to hear a five-star review? Please, iTunes five-star review. This is from One Girl's Problems. Uh, this is from Roxy Marie, who is at One Girl's Problems Podcast, so check them out. She says, great. Really love you guys. Addressing self-esteem in episode 10. Keep up the great work. Thank you very much, Roxy Marie. Roxy Marie is one of my Instagram buddies, so she's a big fan of the show. Thank you so much. Yeah, and She's got an awesome show, too, by the way. Mm-hmm.